Okay, good evening Hello. and welcome. Um, Alex is very plain tonight, very plain. Plain? Well, you know, something like um, that. Something. A more helicopter. <laughs> here we go, here we go. So the man with no shirt, the man with no shirt. Well, good evening and welcome. And today we are doing all things Spain and a little bit of chat about wine maturation, both the process before it gets into the bottle and how it can age afterwards. We're going to try a couple of new things today. Um, well, I say a couple of new things, one new thing. We're going to have a little quiz at the end. So oh, yes. for those of you who yes, know we what we do, we have Slider where you can put all your tasting notes in. And once we get past wine number six, there is going to be a little quiz. So you can pop your name in, you can quiz along, you can have some and fun with it. you could be the winner. And if you win, you can win a bottle of wine that we'll send you next time you order some wine from us. So uh, happy days, happy days, happy days. So the chat is open, pop in, ask us your questions, and we shall go from there. Um, We're talking about Spain. Spain and how wine ages over time. And this is a wonderful, wonderful topic. Um, and Spain, we figured... So so Jamie is one who said, when we're going to split the, the, the world up by regions, how are we going to decide which region we talk about which topic? And you said Spain's the best place for talking about wine aging. So why? So let me talk a little bit about aging while you get the Slido back up in the Badger Cam so everyone can get their taste notes in. So I think what's great about Spain is when you take all these different styles of wine, um, you've got the ability to play with lots of different things as well. Um, the, the the fact that a lot of these grapes and a lot of these styles of wine will lend themselves to doing different things. You know, when we'll, we'll get a little bit further on, we'll talk about Tempranillo. And Tempranillo can be done as a beautiful, light, fresh style. But it also can do very well being aged and, you know, a beautiful level of richness and oakiness. When we get onto, um you know, we do a Tempranillo Blanco, does really well um, with either you know, being light, fresh, easy going, or does really well with, you know, some oak. So a lot of this, when we talk about what should a wine taste like, and, you know, blind tasting is going to be a yeah. bit of a nightmare sometimes, it is about what the winemaker is trying to do and what the winemaker wants. And I think that's what's really exciting about Spain is there are a decent amount of rules and regulations about... Um, yields and regions and what people can do and can't do but there's also when we talk about like you know rioca or ribera or somewhere like that and we talk about the the aging system with crianzas reservas grand reservas hole and that kind of stuff there's that ability to kind of be able to do what you would want to do with it so you can have a little bit of a best of both worlds you can have some you know yeah. great wine styles but also put your own little edge on it but it also keeps the consumer safe that they know what they're kind yeah, of going to get kind of want to know what if we're going to buy a bottle of this wine it it, it can't be crazily different so kind of, it's, it's it's got to be what you expect so and i think that's, that's kind of the uh, the old world new world debate yeah. for me like new world you can basically do what you want grow what you want but it makes it very difficult for the consumer to understand what style that wine's going to be true in the old world sometimes it can be a little bit restrictive and therefore, it stifles any level of um, innovation. Innovation, that's yeah. the word I was looking for. But there we Creativity, go. Creativity, all sorts of so, all sorts of words. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about yeah. uh, wine number one while everyone's diving in and getting their tasting notes in and the like. Oh, yeah, let's move that on. So, um, yeah. so this is Bodegas Pisuerga Aguazul Verdejo. So an organic wine from Rueda in Spain. And this is, I think, the epitome of what a light, fresh, good drinking Spanish wine could be all about. A lot of people go, oh, what do you think of Vadejo? What's Vadejo like? And for me, it's almost Spain's answer to Sauvignon Blanc. It's, you know, okay. it's got this lovely freshness. Yep. It's got some texture. It's got this greenness to it. And I think that, you know, the three main white grapes we're going to be looking at when we talk about um, Spain is going to be the Vadejo. It's going to be Albarino that you see in Galicia. And then it's going to be Viura, which is your white wine for, well, I say for classic Rioja. We've got Tempranillo Blanco next. So True. there are some other cool things. But I think those are the big ones that we see. Uh, see, and there we are. We've got that lemon. We've got lemongrass. We've got that citrus. We've got this creaminess. Um, but yeah, this is 100% Verdejo. 
No oak in there. All done in stainless steel. And I just think it's bright, it's fresh, it's delightful, it's beautiful. What do you think? You're a creamy lemon. Oh, that's helpful, helpful, yeah. helpful. Um, as no, it, it's it's great. It's it's got the complexity that you you want from a blend, but it is also not over the top. It's it's it just focuses on the things you want, doesn't it? It's, yeah. It's like so. What what the, what they do here is they do a, a little bit of a thing called batonage. So when you've got the the leaves in the um in the bottom of the the tank, they give it a stir, and that kind of comes up and goes, and that's what gives you that texture and that creaminess. Not huge amounts of it, but it's there. Um, and sometimes when they do this, like batonage or lee stirring or whatever you like to call it, wherever in the world you're making these things, um, sometimes that can get uh, mistaken for oak. People think, oh, that tastes like oak yeah. because you've got yeah. that richness. But it's absolutely they so often not. Goes together, so, yeah. It's like often when you get people who do that technique, you find them going around and stirring the barrels just to make sure that it all integrates. But also at the small scale, when you've got a small barrel of these things, 228 litres or 225, depending on the exact format, but you've got this small barrel, it it moves. It moves around inside that barrel. And so <clears throat> when you get the bigger formats, like really cool tanks, like eggs and um, tulips, these these incredible shapes that they're all designed to keep the stirring motion going through the convection currents, through the heat that's generated by the, the, the biological action of the fermentation. Mm. And so it just moves around. And so you get that an increased level of, on these small barrels and it, it's it just integrates things and it moves things around yeah. so when, when we talk about the maturation side of this obviously we're in stainless steel tanks so that just keeps the wine yeah. crisp fresh doesn't allow any oxygen in so you don't get any oxygenation any of those kind of characteristics and age-wise we do about three months in the tank and then it's put in the bottle and it's designed this kind of wine is designed to be drunk will it be yeah. you know a year later two years it's not going to go bad but it's not going to improve. This wine is designed to be picked up and drunk and got on with. And I just think this is just a beautiful, fresh style of wine, but with a bit of personality. Sometimes yeah. we talk about crisp and fresh and light, and it just is watery and wet and not much to it. Yeah, look at the tasting notes. There's some cool stuff in there. Lemongrass, lemon verbena, marjoram, thyme. That, that it's not just a one-dimensional thing. This is There's something going on here. There's definitely something going on there. Absolutely, oh, it's it's herbaceous. It it it's like smelling your your herb garden in the uh, out 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 to your back door. That it's so cool. It that's is. that's that's so much more complex than a simple like you were saying the Pinot Grigio or something. Absolutely, so. absolutely. Um, cool. But yeah, beautiful freshness and lovely deliciousness. But anyway, should we move on to our? Next one. Let's move on to the next one. Let's move on to this because I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm excited by this. Why I'm excited not? by this because when is we, it because you spoke to the people? It's, it's it's always nice to speak to the people. It's always nice to speak to the people. But what I like about this, so wine number two, everybody. Let's pop this in the glass and we'll yeah, be good to go. Just, just be, while you're popping that in the glass, what would be your food pairing for wine number one? Wine number one. <sighs> It's light, it's fresh, so, you know, kind of like light seafood, chicken taco, something like that, that, mm -hmm. you know, but you could have a little bit of spice to it because it's got enough weightiness it to it. It's got there, it's got Definitely. enough texture. So it's a very versatile one. I think this is a very easy to pair kind of wine. There's a lot of things this can go with. Um, and I think this is very much, if you like the wine, drink it with whatever you fancy, anything like salads, asparagus, vegetables, I think there's a, a lot of a lot of cool things that we can have with this. I think for me that's the Boccarones wine. That is that 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 olive oil, it needs the acidity to cut through. That that fishy flavour needs something a bit strong to go with it. Um, uh, Brim a la plancha. Brim a la plancha with garlic. Yeah, I'm I, I'm Boccarones, but Brim a la plancha with garlic. Yes. Happy days yes. Yeah, my, my Boccarones definitely had some garlic in there too. So that's that's cool. Um, I like that. Yeah. So, wine number two, we're Finkelman Sanos. I'm not going to talk too much about this right now because I we've got two wines from Finkelman Sanos tonight, uh, one white, one red, and uh, I got a chance to chat with Carlos, who was 
absolutely fantastic, hugely insightful. Um, and it was. <laughs> Can I just stop you? Young and fun, but with wisdom beyond its years. That's but, one of my favourite tasting notes I've ever seen. They're talking about that's me, aren't excellent. they? Excellent. Oh, it's not no, about me. That's about the wine. Talking about me. No, <laughs> I am. I am. What was the opposite of that tasting yeah, note? Old and boring, and frankly, a little bit disappointing. There we go. Wow. Excellent. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks very much. No, that's me. Um, so, Fingerman Sanos, classic Rocker House. They've been around for a, a long, long time. Um, and Tempranillo Blanco is cool. Because it's a mutant. It's a fairly new grape that You're then... a mutant. Had to be done. So it's it's a mutant grape and it hasn't been around for a long time. So they're not really <laughs> quite sure what to do with it yet. Whether it's meant to be stainless steel, whether it's meant to be oaked, whether it's meant to go in clay, whether it's meant to be this. So what we'll do is we'll move the tasting notes on so you can pop your tasting notes in and see what you think, and then we will jump into uh, the interview with Carlos. There's there's a nice little, I don't know, flouncy bit of video at the beginning. I just think it's such a beautiful place, so it kind of showcases the winery. So we've got about eight minutes of video and interview, um, and it's not that one. It's the one that says white tempranillo on it. That, that one. one, exactly. Cool. So we'll uh, go to this one, and we'll be right back. See you in a sec. Welcome, Carlos. Thank you very much for taking the time today to have a little chat uh, with me about the wines of Finca Manzana. So if you just want to introduce yourself to, to everybody on the tasting and tell us a little bit about the winery and your history and why Rioja is exciting. Thank you, Jamie, for, for the opportunity. And uh, I represent the Manzanos family. We are now the fifth generation of the family. We are producing wines mainly in Rioja and Navarra since 1890. So the, the owners are Victor Fernandez de Manzanos and David Fernandez de Manzanos. And as I said, we are producing mainly wines in, uh, in Rioja and Navarra Appellation, but our focus, our limelight is Rioja Oriental. But in order you to know a little bit of our history, the first generation, the second generation, and the third generation, they were grape growers. And... Uh, it was in the 90s with the boom of Rioja wines when we decided, with the fourth generation, when we decided to release our first brand. And our first brand was called Finca Manzanos. 
That's why it's a very important and a very significant brand for, for our winery because it's the first brand that the family released. So unfortunately in 2010, the father of the current owner of the current owners died. And uh, since then the wineries are managed by the fifth generation by Victor Fernandez de Manzanos and David Fernandez de Manzanos. Our main focus is Rioja Oriental. And you may think why Rioja Oriental, Carlos, because we found in Rioja Oriental a unique terroir with more fruit forward wines and also keeping this great acidity. So Rioja Oriental is having more Mediterranean climate that gives this fruit forward. And our vineyards are in high altitude, 400 to 500 meters altitude. And all of these combined to the proximity of the Ebro River that acts kind of a heat sink, you know, maintaining the, the warm and releasing it, maintaining the warm during the day and releasing it at, at nighttime, we consider is the ideal zone to produce some of our, our best brands like Finca Manzanos. So should we talk a little bit about the um uh the Tempranillo Blanca? Uh um, Yes. Because uh, you know I think red, red red is you know red is what we see and what we expect and you know it's a, it's a vast amount of Rioja is red wine, you know, what is it 90ish percent is red wine at the moment? Yeah, uh, well 80 and something, yeah, yeah. 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 Mostly red. But right now whites are very trendy in Rioja. The Bura, as you know, is having a lot of aging potential for aging. Some of the best whites in the world are from, from Rioja, made with Bura. And right now we have a white Tempranillo. White Tempranillo is a rising star variety in Rioja. It was a natural mutation, found it in a red Tempranillo vineyard. So we're sharing 97% DNA with the red Tempranillo. And it was founded in, as I said, in 1988 in Murillo de Rio Leza. So this is a rising star variety in Rioja is something different, only planted in, in Rioja. And this particular wine is coming from, from the south part of Rioja Oriental, from a vineyard between 700 to 80 to 800 um, meters of altitude. It is considered one of the highest vineyards in, uh, in the entire Rioja appellation. So it's having really great acidity that as you know is a key for aging potential and uh, we have tried to, to represent this variety in in our most special brand Finca Manzanos and that's why we have created this Finca Manzanos white tempranillo aged for four months in oak and fermented also for months in oak so mostly French oak we want to give this subtle note coming from from the from the French oak Absolutely. So, and for for a Tempranillo Blanca, is are you generally finding, and this is very general, are you generally finding it in a little bit of oak, or are people making you know styles with no oak, styles with more oak? Because um, I sometimes feel the 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 whites from Rioja can not be dissimilar to kind of when they age a little bit of uh, some of the great whites of Burgundy. They've got that lovely richness, but are we also seeing kind of fresh crisp styles as well as the kind of slightly more um textural styles yeah with with the white tempranillo it it, it is to be honest with you it's a, a variety that we are still discovering right it's considered the, the latest white variety appeared in the world and but as we are having really great acidity we consider it's having a great potential for aging mm -hmm. so but at the beginning people are trying to be more you know young wines fresh freshness and now bit by bit we are trying to 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 eight in oak so yeah yeah i think it's it's absolutely delicious it has that beautiful freshness it's got that texture mm -hmm. and while it's in the barrel is there do you do any lee stirring just to kind of bring that in or does it kind of sit you rack it off and then it takes its time in barrel it's it's to sit it just in barrel yeah yeah so this is having mainly citrus tropical floral notes with nuances of cream and white pepper that adds these layers of sophistication to the wine. That's fantastic. And, and what kind of what kind of local food pairings do you think work with with this style of wine? Any kind of fish, of course. 
and uh, also light meat like chicken as he said for four months in oak and we also consider light meat should be per very well with this and uh, of course vegetables and uh, fresh fresh fish and I, I think this cries out you know that anything fresh that summer barbecue you know fish on the grill shrimp Correct. asparagus those kind of things i think it's it's beautiful but it's also got enough freshness that if you just want to open a glass and drink it you can do that as well it's it seems yes. to be a very versatile style for for many occasions mm -hmm. correct it is good though it is really good it's really good that's fantastic perfect um any final thoughts on on the um on the tempranillo blanca I think, as I said before, the white tempranillo is a variety that we are still discovering with with great acidity, and we will see a lot of lot of white tempranillos in the future with an outstanding style like this white finca manzanos white tempranillo that I hope all your customers are gonna enjoy it. Okay, welcome back. I just um just Carlos's enthusiasm and his excitement for the the finca manzanos wines is absolutely fantastic. Um, I think it's beautiful. Um, yeah, you know, Jana, Garnacha Blanca, you know, we're seeing that in lots of places, south of France, South Africa, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, Tempranillo Blanco came about that we were growing Tempranillo and being a red grape. And then one day there was some that hadn't changed color. So they took that away to the nurseries, cultivated it and made it into his own brand. And, you know, <laughs> talking to Carlos, it's like, so how does this age? He's like, we're not really sure yet. Maybe we can, you know, we'll talk in 20 years' time and talk about old vine uh, Tempranillo Blanco. So that's really exciting. Um, and, yeah, down to the comment that we did a um, we did a, a white Rioja made with Euro in a previous tasting. That was, in fact, <laughs> this one, the Luis Canas 2020 Old Vines. And um, for those who <clears throat> missed it in our shenanigans at the beginning, um, if you're on Slido, we're going to have a little quiz at the end and that is going to be a um that's going to be the prize a bottle of that so uh to go on with your next order so happy days look at that you're putting everything in there oh what's going on with that you've you've clicked the middle thing there you go he's back happy days that's... there we go so yeah, so there we are. So a bottle of Lewis Ken is up for things, um, up for winning. If you can uh, get top points on our Slido quiz later on today. So yeah, you just you look at the um, the tasting notes for that. It's the page is just full, um, either because there's loads of tasting notes or the um, the tasting lasted too long. Um, but there we go. Um, what are you playing with me? There we are. So. Um, so yeah, so that was our two whites. Um, so this one, obviously, that we just tasted is about four months in oak. So oak to kind of give it a bit of texture, a bit of flavor, but not for it to be the start of the show like you do get, yeah. you know, when we talk about something like Australian Chardonnay or California Chardonnay or those kind of things. So probably time for a little red, sir. What do you think? That seems fair. That seems, seems fair. fair. Let me <clears throat> give you the bottle for Badger Cam. Here is the Finkmanzanas uh, whites, by the way. There you go. Pretty. Okay, so moving into reds, and we are heading down to Valencia. So we're southeastern Spain, and this is Sela de Rure. Got a glass, sir? Uh, yes. There you go. There's a glass. There we are. So we are Cellar de Rure. So we're down in Valencia, and this is a Garnacha blend. Um, so Garnacha, a big grape in Spain. We see a lot of it in Navarra. Uh, we see some of it in Rioja. Um, you know, and in Rioja, it's really, really used as a blending grape. In Navarra, it can be used for all kind of things. Um, and it was for a long time, it was done as just a kind of cheap and cheerful bulk grape because it grew very well you got good yields you could grow it on flat land where you could machine harvest all that kind of stuff um but we're now starting to see it in not only quality wise in blends we're starting to see um there's a new 
set of rules in Spain that you can have these single vineyard wines um, called Pagos. Um, so it's this single estate that kind of does that. And there's a lot of people doing Grenache with this. So this is Garnacha, and it's blended with a 30% of a grape called a Mando, um, which is indigenous to the region. You don't really see it anywhere else. Um, it's got, like anything in Spain, it's got synonyms out of its ears, depending what part of the country it's grown in. Um, it can also be called Garo, which translates literally as the ankle of a pig, which uh, sounds delightful. Um, Beautiful, but, yeah. But Mando has this lovely kind of spiciness to it. The Grenache has this kind of fruit. And uh, Cella de Rure um, in Valencia, their whole thing is about protecting indigenous grapes. And I know on a lot of the tasting, we've talked about Southern Italy, where they do that, that kind of thing. It's not let's just plant what's popular and what we can sell and what we can do that. It's really planting about what's important in the region. So these guys are behind the um, Serra Gruda hills. So they're protected from from the uh, from the elements. And, you know, these guys are right on the top of the hillside. So this one, we talk about the wine maturation in this. So this is 2020 vintage. So it's had a little bit of time in the bottle. But it has no oak on it. And usually mm -hmm. when you see a wine this kind of style, this heavy, there's usually a little bit of oak just yep. to kind of help it along. Um but yeah, this is, you know, so this is done You in... would be forgiven for mistaking that this had oak, wouldn't you? Absolutely. So it's... It's got that vanilla character that you often get. So oak. what we've got in here that kind of gives you that little bit of creaminess is this yeah. wine goes through malolactic fermentation, which yeah. takes the malic acid, which is kind of your apple kind of mm -hmm. sharp acids, and turns them into lactic acids, which are the kind of more creamy, more richness, that co those kind of flavours. So they do that in a stainless steel tank. And then once it's gone through malolactic fermentation, they stick it in a clay pot, um, <laughs> which is a 2,800 litre clay pot. So that is a big bit of clay. That's a big clay pot. That is a yeah. big clay pot. So that goes in these big clay pots, which allows, because clay is porous, similar to an oak barrel, it allows a little bit of oxygen mm -hmm. to get in, but really without imparting very much flavour. There's not yeah. a lot of flavour coming out of clay. So the whole thing is about having beautiful, fresh fruit, but getting a slightly, and not even an oxidative characteristic, it's a developmental yep. character um, that you would get if you put it in an oak barrel, but you don't want the flavour, and you wouldn't get it if you tucked it in stainless steel. So clay gives you that kind of yeah, almost good, happy medium. Almost best of, of both worlds. Yeah. Um, I think clay's interesting because it's one of the oldest vessels known to make wine in you know you go back six thousand years to armenia and, and you've got yeah amphoras and things Clevery. like that but it's kind of doing this loop now that it's now the cool thing to do yeah. but a lot of the clay vessels are being used generally what we see on the shelves to make these kind of slightly more funky yeah. new age um like orange wines and skin contact wines and things like that so I think sometimes clay gets associated with these orange wines or natural wines or things like that, which and people can have their personal opinion on. Also, some of the on. off flavors that you often get with those, which is tough because you know there's, there's no reason why it's got to have those flavors, but it often does. Mm. So, yeah, you you get natural wines and orange wines associated with basically wine faults, it's, it, mm. it's things that shouldn't have happened. But I think this, you know. This is the work is done in the vineyard and in the winery. I don't think there's a lot of work to be done in the bottle no. for this. This is, you know, if you left it, would you get some more tertiary flavors? Of course you would. You yeah. get a little bit more chocolate. You maybe get a little bit more earthy, mushroomy forest floor. And I think when we talk about the age of wine, so much of it is about how you prefer to drink your wine. There's definitely some wines that do need a touch of time because they are very, very tannic and very astringent yeah. when they're young, big Barolos and things like that. But generally, with maturation in the bottle, you'll start with something that is okay. bold, juicy, fruity. Bold. Yep. And it's all fresh fruit, black fruit, red fruit, whatever fruit you've got in there, and it punches you in the face with all this juice. And then you've got the secondary flavours, which you'll get either from some oak or, you know, some lee stirring or whatever you're doing it with the kind of like wine, wine, wine maker techniques. Yeah. And then you get the tertiary flavours, which are your developmental characteristics, which is when we talk about coffee, mocha, tobacco, forest floor, all that kind of good stuff. So the longer you leave it, the less juicy fruit you have and the more 
kind of earthy, tobacco-y, tertiary flavors you get. So if you like a wine with lots of tertiary flavors, leave your wine for a long, long time. Absolutely. If you like big, fruity, juicy, drink it now. Um, and then there's anywhere in the middle that you want to get that balance. And, um, you know, there's a the law of wine maturation is because people go, oh, how long is this wine good for? How long should I keep it for? The, however long it takes the wine to get to peak condition is how long it will stay at peak condition, which is a good rule of thumb. Because if you take your, you know, your light, fresh Italian Pinot Grigio, it probably is ready to go in three months, six months. And then it's probably got three months, six months to drink because you want to drink it same vintage. And then you have your old Bordeaux that might take 20 years to get to where it should get. And then they can hang out for 20 years. So I think that's kind of quite a good rule of thumb. You know, a Chardonnay that's ready to drink in three or four years probably then has a three or four year window. So it's not the perfect answer because every wine is different and the way people make wines and it's how you want to drink it. But it can go. Um, (laughs) Oh, that's a great question. So that is, if I told you I knew, I would be lying to you. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some people down there doing 100% Mandos, um, you know, whether it's for a commercial thing or just, you know, for table wine and stuff like that. I've never had 100% Mando, um, but I, I'll have a look at Cellar de Rure. If there's anyone doing it, it would be them guys because... They've got a big chunk in here. It's 30%. It's not, you know, sometimes you get these people doing indigenous grapes and they chuck 5 or 10% in there just to say they're doing it. Yeah. Um, but I'll have a little look, and if I can find out some more information, I'll uh, I'll give you a shout and let you know. Um, Do you but... think Ian's watching tonight? He is. He is. I saw him. Hi, Ian. Um, because if there were to be a rule that governed what you were to do with that grape, I would say that would be the Mando law, Ian. That's like the Mandalorian. I know what you did there. Oh, my you word. See, you see, did you, my you've been looking at that for a long time to get that across. <laughs> my apologies to everyone at home. He can get back to uh, clicking the buttons oh, and answering I'll the chat. Yeah. Exactly. But, you know, this grapefruit, lovely richness. And I think I think Grenache is a grape that doesn't get enough love. It kind of it goes in as a blending grape. I'll, I'll tell you, my back's getting sore from carrying this show. Um, so. Oh, dear. Grenache, you know, sometimes gets gets lost, but we're seeing, you know, you know, Australia people are starting to plant more Grenache because it's getting a little bit too hot for Syrah. When we go down into the Rhone Valley, we talk about Syrah, but when we get into Southern Rhone, Grenache is the the main blending yeah. grape. It's the the key component of so many of those wines down there, but we don't often see it by itself. So it's really exciting to kind of have this uh, richness, this ripeness, and I think this is just a fun, cool wine. It is. Do you have um, a look? Do you have a- let, let, let's get the tasting notes up. and But also, I would say, let's compare them to what you said in the single, uh, our little three characteristics that we like to put up. So cherry, smooth and red berries, people are saying. Uh, you're saying red berries and spice, juicy, kind of cherry, drinkable, and best, best served with slow-cooked beef. Slow cooked beef. I think that sounds great. I think that sounds all right. It's, I'm just hoping that people at home agree with me. You know, it's uh, no, no, he's got it all wrong. He's got it all wrong. Um, so yeah, and just to say, like now we've started and we're going to have this. If you're ever bored of listening to us, if you scan the QR code on the um, on the little tasting sheet, it will take you to a the website where you can buy it, and b there's a handy minute ish long video. video from me just kind of uh, giving the one-two on it. So if you get yeah. don't want to listen to me for 15 minutes on each wine and can put up with me for 90 seconds, that's a new option that, uh, you know, we're going to try and get that with all the wines on the website so there's a little bit more kind of, Quite when you're right. there, you can yeah. see what's going on. If it's something you've missed on a tasting or something that's not been on a tasting that we've just got here, you can get a little bit of a, a one-two on what's going on. All right. We talked about it for a while and they're finally there, so... Go for it. Go and uh, check them out. Um, scan the QR code. Go to the website. See the video, and you'll just remind yourself of things that you've you've learned. So happy days. Absolutely. So yeah, I, this is. I just think this it's is good. It's great there. wine. Great value. Deliciousness. Happy days. So the next couple of wines that we're going to go on to, we got we got we got two more reds, and we're in Rioja, and we're doing a Crianza, and we're doing a Grand Reserva. So same. 
kind of great makeup. You know, they can be blends, but, you know, Rioja is based with Tempranillo, Garnacha, Mansuelo, oh. Graziano, and the whites, um, Viura, Malvasia. Sometimes you can put, they'll co-ferment the, the whites and the reds in there. Um, but a lot of Rioja is about oak, and we've talked a fair bit about oak today. So before I yabber on any more about oak, we can get wine number four into the glass, which is the Luis Canas Crianza. But Alex has put together a little video just explaining a bit about oak, what it does, why we need it, mm-hmm. and where it comes from. So uh, we're going to pop to this quick video, get the uh, Crianza in your glass, and we'll come back for some tasting notes. See you in a bit. Those green-robed senators of mighty woods, tall oaks, branch charmed by the earnest stars, dream and so dream all night without a stir. That is what Keats had to say about oak trees. I don't think I can beat his words, but there really is something quite special about them. Now, we often hear winemakers talking about oak, but what do we actually mean? Firstly, most people assume we're talking about barrels of different sizes. Barrels are very expensive up to 3,000 euros for a standard sized one in fact. And that only stores 300 bottles of wine. So that can add up to 10 pounds to the cost of the wine. Let's start off looking at how barrels are made because you might be surprised at how intricate it is. Firstly, an old oak tree that is the perfect shape and size is found to cut down. These are normally around 100 years old. They're cut or split into planks and these are left in giant piles to be seasoned for about a year or so. During this time, microorganisms start doing some work on them and changing the characteristics of the wood, and it all just mellows. When it comes time to be used, the blanks are planed and smoothed to make the final shapes for the barrel. These are then arranged into a flower shape with a hoop at the bottom. After this, they are toasted. That is, a fire is lit in the middle of it, and the wood is left to generate a little bit of a crust, and we'll come to why later. The barrel is squeezed into the right shape and more hoops are pushed down before adding tops and bottoms and being tested and made water and wine tight. It turns out that wine is less dense than water, so it leaks even more. Now, we use oak and wine for two different reasons. First, it's the flavour that they add. Flavours like vanillin. But secondly, they let a tiny amount of air into the wine which helps it mature. Too much is very bad, but too little makes for a harsher wine. We'll talk about the flavours first. You'll perhaps not be shocked to learn that not all breeds of oak tree are the same. Some are even poisonous. It's like the difference between an Earl Grey and a Lapsang Souchon tea. Some is in the type of plant and some is in how it's treated. The two main types are what's called French oak or American oak. French oak's generally regarded as higher quality. That's a bit unfair, it's just associated with a certain flavour profile. American oak is generally a little sweeter, but there's also Hungarian oak which is rising in popularity. We often talk about food pairing, but there's definitely pairings which work better with wood as well. French oak goes best with Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon, while American oak is better with Zinfandel and Tempranillo, such as in Rioja. But it's not just the type of oak, that toasting has a huge effect. If you don't toast it, the wine tastes, well, of oak. But beyond this, it generally makes the wine taste sweeter, then adds flavours of vanilla, crusty toast, nuts and smoke before finally ending up acrid and burnt. Many winemakers like to use a blend of wines aged in different kinds of oak treated differently. The sheer number of different compounds this adds gives real complexity to the wine. But young barrels also act like sponges. They absorb the wine several bottles worth. It's much worse for a cut oak, like American, than it is for wood that's split along the grain, like French oak. The older the barrels, the more subdued the flavouring effect gets. Really old barrels are known as neutral, which means they add a negligible amount of flavour. Most barrels are around 225 litres. The bigger the barrel, the less flavour it adds, because while there might be more wine, there's less oak touching the wine. The biggest oak fermenter we've ever come across is this one, Hercules. This took 20 Master Coopers three whole months to make. I can't even imagine how much that one costs. Of course, wineries are businesses, and using oak adds an awful lot of cost and complexity, so the accountants wanted to try to find a cheaper way. The first thing that winemakers did to add oak flavours was to dip staves or spirals, big chunks of oak on strings, into the wine as it sat in the steel tanks, a bit like dunking a tea bag. Large-scale winemakers want to get the wine out as soon as possible, so rather than use one big lump of wood, breaking it into smaller chips makes that process much faster. But it is coarser too. You start getting the bad characteristics from the wood as well. But it's the only cost-effective way to add an oaky character to a budget bottle of wine. 
And this is what led to the overwrote reputation of some Australian and American Chardonnays that just ruined this poor innocent grape. Anyway, the other side, aging. Without going too sciencey, the young harsh tannins in wine, which largely come from the skins, need to link up together with other tannins, and some of these come from the wood too, but to do that, they need oxygen. Luckily, wood is a little porous, and so lets in that tiny amount of air necessary to join those compounds together or polymerize them, which is to form longer, smoother chains, mixtures of wine and oak tannins, which are much, much more pleasant. Too much oxygen, however, and all of your fruit flavors will get destroyed. Of course, accountants are still looking for shortcuts, and people have found ways to try to get this micro-oxygen effect by putting small pipes into the stainless steel tanks that allow a little bit of oxygen to seep in and bubble through. Other people are trying to reduce the price of oak by using some really creative solutions. These ones from Ribarique are very cool. They have oak staves in a cuboid tank, which is far more space efficient, and they're flat. So it's much easier to take them apart, plane them down and re-toast them, making it much more reusable. Finally, there's the question of when you use the oak and for how long. The longer you leave the wine in contact with the oak, the more of an effect it has. From our discussions with winemakers, there's some vastly different ideas about which stage is best to use it. Fermenting an oak certainly gives a very different flavour to ageing an oak. But this is a, yet another part of winemaking which comes down to a mystical combination of art and science, and you can't look at it just on its own. Each winemaker is crafting their own technique and has their own views about oak, which imparts a really unique style on the wine, and it either works as a whole piece or not. It's not just what they do with that one thing. Oak can be brilliant. It can be so subtle it just changes the texture of the wine, or it can slap you in the face. Winemakers are increasingly shying away from the in-your-face style, and are seeking out subtleties in how these simple, natural materials can be brought together to form something which is utterly magical. So, how cool is that? <laughs> everything you wanted to know about oak from Alex Taylor. So, um, if you're bored of oak now, we will not talk about it anymore. But so, when we well, we will because we're going to talk about it. Yeah, we are. So, Lewis Canyon is 2019, and we're starting to see a little bit of a change in Rioja. People talk about classic Rioja versus modern Rioja. And uh, classic Rioja is all about American oak and vanilla and aging times and about the bodega. And then we've got what the, the modern Rioja, which is people are kind of looking for almost single vineyard sites from, you know, a more of a sense of place of the Rioja rather than going, oh, this is just Rioja. Um, and then there's a fair few people who are doing a little bit of a little bit of both. So Lewis Canyons, for this one in particular, this is um, it's all new oak, but it's 60% um, French and 40% American. So leading to a slightly more elegant style. So when we talk about different types of oak, your two main types are American oak and French oak. And, you know, we... so, do, we've got uh, we've got our... Um... Hopefully everybody has got the thing which describes a bit of the difference between French and American oak. It's on the back page. It's on the back page, yeah. So, you know, your American oak is what's giving you the the clove, the coconut, the vanilla kind of flavours. And French oak is it's a little softer, a little gentler, more kind of like dilly, herbaceous kind of things. Um, as I said, I could lead it to you to, to, you know, I could read the back of the thing or I can just leave you to a catch up and uh, have a look at it yourself before we talk too much more about oak. Um, but, you know, if we go back to the the tasting notes here, you know, there's a lot of those kind of oak flavors. We've got vanilla, uh, we've got clove, we've got all the kind of, you know, good flavor, that toast in there. But we've also got the fruit flavors. We've got the plums, we've got the blackberries. <laughs> um, I love that. Smells like you could do a mean Argentinian <laughs> tango. What I'd love to see, I'd love you to send oh, us in a video yes. of what a mean Argentinian tango looks like. That'd be really helpful because uh, I'm not sure. It's sultry, sultry. I, I love the taste sultry. of it sometimes. So there's some really cool stuff in there. But yeah, Lewis Canyon is absolute pioneers in Rioja. It used to be you'd make your wine, your young wine, you'd just kind of send it out and <laughs> bulk it, and then your good stuff you get for Crianza Reserva, Grand Reserva, that kind of stuff. Um, but these were one of the first people to actually bottle the young wine and sell Joven under their own name uh, because the quality of the fruit. And we'll see when we get to the next wine. I think what's important is... A reserve is not better than a Crianza. A Grand Reserve is not better than a... No, they're, Reserva. They're just they're themselves. stylistically yeah. different, and I think the sign of a really good Rioja house is when you can taste the difference between the levels. 
some of the there's some real houses out there that you go well there's crayons and then there's reserve and you go well what's actually the difference and it's like six quid that's the difference you know they're they're very 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 similar so i just think this is a beautiful rich wire glad yeah super interesting and really enjoying i'd like that i like that so you know there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff to be said about Luis Canyas. and you know for those of you who have been with us for a while you know, you might notice, and Alex was talking to me during the thing. <laughs> I kind of run round, and we end up doing Luis Canyas again, and we end up doing Finca Manthanos <laughs> again. But I think, A, they're great wineries. B, they've looked after us all the way through. They've given yeah. us interviews. They've given us content. They've helped out. And C, I think if you're looking for stylistically, this is what it should be. I think those yeah. wineries, and there's, there's great one. You know, we've done we've done Marcus de Murrieta as well. We've done Badiola. There's phenomenal ones. But these guys, I just think they, they hit the nail on the head for what they're supposed to be. And I think they offer really good bang for the buck that you yeah. go, oh, this is, mm, it's really worth every penny that's in there. So it's a cool wine. I think, I think that's that lovely thing about Rioja is that it brings together the art of blending, the art of choosing these different components, different grapes, um, and creating something that every year, you know, despite what has happened in the climate, despite what's happened with the, you know, the, the vineyard could have been flooded. The vineyard could have been parched dry. And yet, you know, when you buy this wine, you know what it'll taste like. And that's cool. That what, is impressive. What I also that's think impressive. as a winemaker that I think, you know, if you're making a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, yeah? You pick the grapes, you taste yeah. the grapes, and you go, All right, that's going to make this kind of style, yeah. and people are going to drink it in the next week or yeah. whenever they pick it up. Rioja, that you can, when you talk about like a, a Grand Reserva that has that kind mm-hmm. of aging time, they pick a berry and go, I'm going to, I've got to chuck this in an oak barrel for yeah, at for least years. three years, yeah. then <laughs> stick it in a bottle, and at the end of that, I know I it's going perfect. to be good. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, between that and the people who make the initial blend for champagnes when those things are so high acid and paint yeah, I'm just I'm with you on that. I think there's just yeah. a level of magic that if you if you if you do champagne and you go to a, a tasting, those wines they're awful. Are not oh they're bloody awful. They're not palatable, are they? No, it's just horrible. like so high yeah. acid, like it's your like... eyes will and there's someone there going that and 14% it's, of this it's and 12% like of that. It's sulfuric acid. It's and horrid. You do that and then knowing that at some yeah. point you're going to add a little bit of dosage to that yeah. to do this to create. And How especially, the and especially you find those flavors. To, and especially, to say, the, those are the ones that are going to persist. These will evolve. These ones will persist. And the thing is, vintage champagne. That's that small. Vintage champagne, I think that's a different story because you can be different every. Yeah. But the guys who are out there making Vuclico or Bollinger or Moet that yeah. aren't vintage, they're doing non-vintage and want to try and create a house style every year. I yeah. think that's phenomenal it's to be able to build fun. that consistency. Yeah, it... Oh, where have we gone? I don't know. Uh, has the camera gone off? Do you want to go and have a look? Or do you want me to go and have a look? I can't get to it, so I might. For yes. now... <laughs> we are. are we oh, back? we're back. We're back. Well, that's fantastic. Well, but for now, <sighs> <Come on. laughs> it's still being a bit weird. But but that's fine. Okay, you continue going. So yeah, I know. I I agree. I think the art of blending is undervalued because i think we think that blends are a way of using cheap grapes cheap crap grapes and um if i angled this up so why would we care about blending if it's all about using some grapes from here and a few from there the things you've got available to you um i it it's hard it's not it, because I think if you've got a single vineyard and you go, this past this vineyard ripens early, and this past this sing, single vineyard, same clone, same grape, everything's the same, you have to blend them. You have to blend them. It, it's, um, it's as simple as that. And, and that is 
as skillful a job as being a mission starred chef trying to find I'm going to blend this part of cream with this part of city, this part of uh, everything. And um, um, I think blending is great. So, and I think what's fascinating for me is that how many top chefs are now starting to use fermentation as a style to try to kind of um, modify their flavors and, and bring complexity to their foods just like they would do if they were winemaking. So I think it's it there's no surprise that when you've got someone like um you know Roger Parr and and you know, who spent his life as a sommelier and uh, working in restaurants, he actually turns out to be a great winemaker because you are combining different flavors, different aging methods, different uh, treatments you can do to bring them all together to, to create something cool. Um, is that one still not working? No, That's fine. Gonna Don't try. Worry. I'm going to try one more time, and then we'll just <laughs> re-angle this camera. Okay. Uh, if not, I'll put this over there. <laughs> Bloody thing. Got to love it. Okay. We're going on to back okay, camera. Okay. We're going on to back up camera. So we are going to look down there at, at the, the people. Badge cam. At the okay, people. They're right down there. So, oh. so blending is not a dirty did, word. Did we? Did we win an award? Crevice. Did we win? A, crevice did, is a positively disgusting. Did we? Did we win? A, blending is not. Did we win an award for our wine tasting? We did, didn't we? Okay. So it's like a chef adding seasoning, knowing his ingredients. Thank you, Sophia. That's perfectly said. Yep. Absolutely is. Um. So. And and I think what what I love about it is how open most winemakers are about this. They they talk about it as if there's like there's a pepper character to this particular plot in my vineyard. I I, I know this this is the peppery plot. I want this one. This is the super rich fruity part of the vineyard. I want that bit, uh, and I will merge them depending on how much I wanted those different characteristics. So. Yeah, it's it, it's exactly like adding seasonings, and um, the badgers bring their own unique character to the the process. Let's say that exactly. But there we are. So anyway, so, let's move into wine number five. Wine we're number staying five. With, yeah. We're staying with we're staying with Rioja, and we're going to Grand Reserva. And for those of you who have been for us a while. I think this is the first time we've actually gone back and done the same wine. We did it as a, my favourite at some point last year. And it was mine. It was, this was, it was my favourite. It was your favourite. Yeah, it's our yeah, favourite. Yeah. So it's come back in again this year because there was still a little bit of it available. And I thought, <laughs> why not? Because it's not often that we get to drink 20-odd-year-old wine for fun. So, uh, actually, I think we should go back to that because... That was an interesting moment in our time because we opened the bottle and we looked at it and we smelled it and the wine was flat. It wasn't it wasn't awful. It was flat. It was um you I was expecting the ones that I'd tried from when I'd tried the wine before, the complexity, lots of different things coming together. A little bit of fruit, a little bit of uh, oak, a little bit of age, all coming together to find this perfect balance that I thought was such great value. Mm. And when, when I smelled it, it was like, there's nothing, there's nothing there. The it, fruit was dead, it was just dusty and... Yeah, just, it, yeah. It, it, and, yeah and, dust, dusty is a great word. And, and, yeah. and everything that we'd raved about, about how great this wine was. So it was like, we'd <laughs> like, tasted it before, we can do it on the show, we opened the book and go, uh, I can't get excited by this because it's wrong. Um, but, you know, that shows it, how it, it is. It, when you are in a restaurant you smell a wine, it takes a while because you're expecting, you know, you were, the, you, you've seen the price on the menu. You know how much this wine costs. You are going, this is a wine that I know should be worth £12 a glass or whatever bloody hell it is. Um, and you want it to be worth that. And if it isn't, you start questioning yourself. Yeah. You're going, this is bloody awful. Yeah. Is a... Or is there something wrong it's with my palate? It's what, 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 what are Am I getting I the here? idiot? Am I the person that's wrong? Is, is it me? No, it's them that's wrong. It's that, that classic Simpsons meme. Um, but... 
in this case, it genuinely was. And you have to remember, nearly 10% of all wine bottles that have a cork in them are wrong. And that's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's why we're such big proponents of alternative packaging because they don't have that variability they don't have that kind of uh, failure rate that uh, others do but anyway should we jump back to let's Finkerman go back Sanos to and go to carlos because uh, yeah, i had a chat with him about this because you're going to talk to people about old wine you should talk to the, uh, Probably talk to the, wine the people in charge absolutely so so it's the one that says grand reserva left that yeah. one yes cool right click See there in a second we'll be back Before we dive straight into that, can you just for for those who, you know, are maybe new to Spanish wine, new to Rioja, there's a lot of words that pop up on the label: Crianza, Reserva, Gran Reserva, Joven, Roble. Can you just do a very quick kind of overview of what these different labels mean and what the you know the current rules are for kind of barrel aging and bottle aging? Just so it's bam, 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 bang. So when we go to Gran Reserva, they know the journey this wine has been on. So. Normally, Joven in Rioja are young wines and oak, or just six months in oak. Frianza are one year in oak and at least six months in bottle. Reservas has to be eight for a minimum of three years, at least one year in oak and two years in bottle. But normally for the reservas, wineries are doing normally two years in oak and one year in bottle. Okay. And of course, the Grand Reserva. Grand Reserva normally is eight. It has to be eight for five years, and normally is eight for three years in oak and two years in bottle. And that's that's absolutely amazing. And it's such a dedication to, to the craft that you're like, not only have you taken all that time to, to grow the grapes, you know, to get the, the vines to where they need to be, you're then harvesting and going, you know, the winemaker has to go, what is this berry going to look like in five years time? And I think that's such a talent. Um, I think when you make light, fresh wines of a current vintage, you know, yeah, that's that, that's going to go in there. That makes our wine and we're going to send it out in three months, six months, something like that. I, th I think there's a just a level of genius to be able to pick those grapes and go, those grapes are going to are going to age well, are going to develop, are going to create this. And the fact that this, you know, 2001 is, you know, 22 years old now and is still a beautiful bottle of wine is is absolutely amazing because it's not always older is better. Um, and the other thing that I just want to touch on like, before we dive deep into this wine is and correct me if you feel differently, but Crianza, Gran Reserva, sorry, Crianza Reserva and Gran Reserva aren't one is better than the other. They're just a different style. Different. If, you want, if you want a fruitier, fresher style, drink Hoven and Crianza. If you want a more complex, earthy style, that's where you go into your Reservas and your Gran Reservas. And I think the sign of a really good Rioja producer is having those differentiations in levels. There are some you know wineries out there that you taste their crianza and you taste their reserva and the only difference seems to be a price tag of about five or six pounds more expensive and there's not a yeah. jump what i love about manzanos is there is this big difference between each level as you go through the aging process mm -hmm. correct so yeah I mean, the aging potential, as, as, as you said, is, is key in, uh, in, uh, in Rioja because the Tempranillo is very famous for the aging potential due to this great acidity and also tanning structure. 
And um, to get back to our history to understand why Rioja started to become very, to became very, very famous in the world, because when Philoxera appeared in, in France, right, in the 18, 1860s, um, all the French grape growers, especially the ones from Bordeaux, came to Rioja to plant to plant their their, their vineyards or well, uh, to produce their their wines in in Rioja because they found the best terroir in Rioja and after they produced their wines there here and well they're in Rioja because I'm in London now um, and after they were bottling and as a French wine right so when they left because the the all the vineyards were recovered they left their techniques and one of the techniques was the aging in oak. Okay, cool. Should we talk a little bit about the 2001 and how this wine, you know, how it came about and how there's still 2001 around? Why haven't people drunk it all? So 2001, Jamie is considered one of the best vintages in the entire history of Rioja. And um, this Grand Reserva is, as I said before, three years in oak and the rest time in, uh, in bottle. So this is 85% Tempranillo and 15% Masuelo. Okay. Masuelo is like Carignan, yeah. giving great acidity, very aromatic and tannin structure to the wine. And uh, I always say that this wine is not just a drink. This is an experience. This wine is an invitation to discover the unique terroir that can only come from, from Rioja. And, uh, and here we are gonna find a lot of intense fruit, especially candy fruit, and uh, and especially tertiary aromas like forest floor, tobacco, leather. Very sleek, very elegant, with these downy tannins and intense finish. Outstanding wines, outstanding wine that embody the very soul of of Rioja Oriental. And the, the, because you said the, it's keeping still the fruit, right? This, the great acidity that we have in, uh, in our vineyards in, in high altitude gives this freshness to this freshness and, uh, and fruit to the, to the wine also, but it's because it's coming from Rioja Oriental that is more fruit forward. And wow. it, I said before that was eight for three years, 75% French and 25% American oak. We always try to be a little bit more modern. Traditionally, Rioja was aged in American oak, and uh, we always are trying to be more with French oak, with these subtle notes, spicy notes. Absolutely. Um, so now, now you know, just to kind of go through the final bit, what's what's next for Finkerman Sanos? Is there, you know, we've talked about Tempranillo Blanco, is there anything else cool and exciting on the horizon? You know, is there going to be any new grapes planted, you know, because of climate change and stuff like that? Um, how 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 is Rioja dealing with, you know, change of climate and the world becoming a little bit harder to grow grapes? Mm -hmm. So we are trying because of the climate change, we are trying to stand out more the Grenache, Graciano and Masuelo. We okay. find they can adapt better to the climate change and also because they, they always always used to grow in more arid conditions so yeah the grenache graciano and masuela are going to be very important variety for us varieties for us in the future and with this as i mentioned before the the single vineyard grenache we are going to stand try to stand in even more more and more the the grenache and graciano and masuela Fantastic. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, Carlos. Um, any final thoughts or words of wisdom or, you know, that uh, you want to share with the, uh, the people this evening? I hope they are going to enjoy our wines, our white Tempranillo that is a new style in Rioja. We consider the latest white variety and also this 2001 that is considered one of the best vintages in the entire Rioja. That is, I always say, Jamie, that wine is an open window to the world that allows us to discover new places and traditions through a glass of wine. So this is a truly invitation to discover Rioja wines. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Jamie. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Cheers. You too. Bye bye. Cheers.
Okay, and welcome back. Just um, once again, I just think this wine <laughs> was spectacular. Um, I think it's great, and I I hope people are pleasantly surprised when they see the prices at the yes. at the end. But should we have a quick look at the tasting notes because there's a there's a lot. There's of hard... some su- such cool tasting notes, and there's a lot a lot of hard work gone into the tasting notes here. It's all gone <laughs> it's all now. Gone. <laughs> we can fix that for you. You just need to order. But Fruity you know. Nuts. Yeah. But but we can see we've got, you know, this is where we talked about those developmental flavours that there's not huge amounts of blackberry, blackcurrant, you know, it's not big enough. We've got a lot of this chocolate, tobacco, coffee. I like the fact that it's smooth. Fruit and nut bar. Like drinking a National Trust House's library. Excellent. Uh, don't worry, we've got a badger in the tasting notes, <laughs> so all is also, okay. longer than anecdote to a boy's ankle. <laughs> that, that is quite, that's quite the finish, isn't it? I, I like that. I like that a lot. I like Excellent. that a lot. But I, I just think it's, uh, you know, a bit of a treat to be able to open a bottle of um, yeah. a 20-odd-year-old um, yeah. bottle of Rioja and it still be stunning. Right. It's yeah. still lively. It's still bright. There's still lots of fruit in there. But it's got all these developmental flavors. So, you know, I think we've had plenty of Finkelman Sanos with the uh, with the two interviews yeah. and the chit chat. So let's move on to Something wine isn't. number six, which is not Finkelman Sanos. Once again, it's someone that we've used lots of. We've been backwards and forwards with Sandemans because Sandemans oh, yeah. um they make both sherry and port. And another one that you know stylistically, what they do is classic and um you know sometimes i think fortified wine doesn't get the love that it should it comes out of the cupboard at christmas especially now we're talking about a cream sherry and um, i think you know people talk stories of cream sherry and it's that blue bottle that comes out the back of yep. your nan's cupboard gets dusted off at christmas you have a, a wee nip of it and it goes back in the cupboard till next christmas and that's kind of what it right. is but sherry i think is a i think it's great wine but be on that educational side, you know, it goes from absolutely bone dry in the Finos and the it's Manzanillas when it goes all the way yeah. up to that very, very sweet PX. So what we've got here is a cream yeah, I, sherry. I, 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 actually, I've got to give you credit because um, when we've done sherry, we've always gone for the super dry, the super sweet, and you've gone for the cream style, which is the most popular style. Otherwise, there's no reason why... You've bristle cream would be a big thing that, that that's that's what it is we like this style and this is a dry style of cream so i think sophia's got a good point in there if you can put that out, that they find sherry challenging next one now oh there we are sorry yeah so everyone was, every, everyone's finding sherry ch- everyone's there Oh, why they call it a superior cream? Because that's just their name. It's uh it's a cream sherry, they just call it superior cream. Um so it's not a, they can. it's not an aging level. Yeah. Um so Sandermans have been around since the late seventeen hundreds. Um and always, you know, it's a Scottish guy from Perth who started it in London. Um and you've got two you've got two grapes in sherry. So Let's go back. Palomino. Sherry has to be made in the Jerez region in Spain. Then they call it the Sherry Triangle. It's down in the south. And they've got this really interesting kind of soil called Alberiza. Um, so it's Alberiza okay. soil, Super kind Sherry of Triangle. Um, and you've got two grapes. You've got Palomino, which yep. is a dry grape, which is, makes most of Sherry. Yep. And then you've got Pedro Jimenez, which is used to make the sweeter styles. So what you'll do is you'll get your Palomino grape and you can make your very, very dry styles, which are your Fino and your Manzanilla. Uh, Manzanilla is the same as a Fino, but it has to come from a region called San Luca de Barameda. You've then got your oxidative, <laughs> you've then got your kind of um, oxidative aged wines. Um, yeah, so y- your Olorosos, your Palacortados, your, your Amontillas. Oh my word, let's not talk about so- that. I mean, but you can't not mention floor. Like, floor is a big part of this. I could mention floor. I didn't need the pun to go with it. Oh, shit. We didn't bring the slides in. No, it's fine. We don't need the slides. Okay. So, floor is kind of yeast, and it sits on top of the wine. It's a surface yeast, a film yeast. It forms a film on top of the wine, and that protects it from oxygen. However, 
it is still a yeast that's that's kind of like a fungal infection. It's it's doing stuff to the wine. It's adding flavour. You it's say you it. say fungal infection. I say biologically aged. Biologically aged. Exactly. Yeah, fair. And okay. that's what gives a you know they're in barrels, so that gives a bit of colour. But this floor gives the colour, the nuttiness, that richness in style. Yeah. So. We go up, we go up, and then cream is kind of the, and I think it's why it's such a popular style, it's the best of both worlds. So they take this nutty, that can sometimes be a little bit bitter, and for people yeah. who struggle to get on with sherry, it's very nutty, it can be it's very dry. It's a um, It's fantastic with I get that. certain things, but Ped it is challenging. Yeah. Pedro Jimenez by itself, I don't know if I meant to drink it or pour it on my ice cream. It's that kind <laughs> of style. <laughs> But this has got this has got ten percent Pedro Jimenez in, which just brings that sweetness and that lovely richness. Do you want to move the tasting notes over? Because I'm interested oh. to see what people have to to yeah, say about sure. this. Um, so Holy I just moly, those are great tasting notes on the last one, by the way. That's fantastic. So yeah, so I just think this has this lovely richness, right. this nuttiness. It's got this beautiful coloration to it. It's a fantastic color. It, that that is spectacular. Look at that. That's that that has become dark because partly of the effect of the Pedro Ximenez or Jimenez grapes, it depends which part of Spain you're coming from as to how you pronounce these things. Um, Just PX. PX, though. PX, PX works for a wine lover. Oh, it's like raisins. It's like those Californian raisins that you feed your kids. It it's is, it, it is so basically intense. take a hand of almonds, a hand of raisins, put them in a blender. There you go. Yeah. That's what you've got. And this, as far as food, you know, it's tiramisu, Christmas, brownies, Christmas. anything Christmassy, you know, Christmas yeah. pudding and this. Oh. But it is. It's... A little bit, a little bit goes a long way because you know we we look at the alcohol percentage. What they do is they they ferment the palomino to about seventeen and a half percent with particular yeast that can survive up to that. So basically, then everything else, nothing else to, can survive. Um, what what sherry does, um, and this is my last technical bit while we put some tasting notes in, it goes through this thing called a solera system, which is basically aging layers. So if you think. At the, you know, and obviously the barrels are stored wherever there. But if you look at it almost like a ladder stage, that you'll have the barrels at the bottom, which is the oldest wine. And what they'll do is they'll go, oh, we're going to take that wine and we'll um we'll put that at the bottle. And then the next oldest wine tops that barrel up. And then the next oldest wine tops that barrel up. And then the next oldest wine tops that barrel up. So you create almost like a house style. And you... Sherry houses will talk about Soleras that are hundreds of years old, yeah. that that bottom barrel started a hundred years ago, yeah. and it's just been topped up. How much hundred year old Sherry is in there? Probably a drop if you're lucky. It's that cold, yeah. old kind of thing that people but, go, but, but, every but, every but, drop of water on this planet's gone for a dinosaur. It's like 50 years old, so yeah. that's cool. So that's they'll take, cool. you know, 10, 20%, sometimes 30% <laughs> out each year to do that, and then. Top it up, top it up, top it up, which I think is really exciting. But you know, you look at the you look at the station notes. We've got raisins, yeah. we've got Christmas cake, we've got all that kind. It's of that intense, stuff. almost like when you add the brandy to the Christmas cake. It it just it just oh, I don't know. It it's almost like the high alcohol of that brandy brings out so many of the as a as a cool kind of like um, solvent. It brings out those. Beautiful, rich flavors mm. from the aged fruits that you've got there, and so that's what you're getting there. Absolutely. And yet, so, should we pull the tasting so notes cool. back up for big screen, just so everyone can have a look yeah. what what everyone's achieved here? Happy there days. It's raisins, treacle, ra so it's raisin and raisins. It just depends how <laughs> you've got one or many. Will yeah. enhance any slodgy Christmas pudding, marzipan, Christmas, and it is. It's just, <laughs> and I think this is the thing we talk about wine. Why wine can evoke memories of places or occasions and things like that because you know it's kind of like you know you smell a pine tree and you think christmas yeah you yeah. smell this you taste this you think christmas and i think it's absolutely beautiful bang on however what we're going to do now oh god because we because now? we've had uh, obviously no technical hitches <laughs> we are going to do our quiz so you need to be on slido to do this we're going to go to the next slide okay then you've got two Pop your name in so we know who you are if you want to play. And then the question will come up. You have 15 seconds 
to answer each question. So get it's, ready. It's multiple choice. Yeah. And at the end of each round, so it's based on getting it right and then by speed. Okay. So he'll go to the next slide. Where are you going? Oh, I clicked play, but it didn't. So, hey, there we go. There you are. Oh, you need to reset that. How do I do that? Uh, cancel that. Where you here's, go? Here's, the, here's the mouse oh, badger. What have you done? I didn't do anything. Huh. Reset results, probably, yeah. That makes sense. I controlled it earlier. Okay. Right. Yeah. There we go. You should now. Start, maybe click start quiz. Oh. There we go. We're coming in. We're coming in. Oh, fantastic. Oh, we're wow. We're going to give everyone another 10 <laughs> seconds to get in if you want to play. 10. Let's go. Nine. Let's go. Eight. Seven. Oh, by the way, I'm counting down. The prize for this is this bottle of Lewis Canyas, who's ever top. But because, you know, we're cheap people, you need to buy some bottles of wine to go with it, and we'll stick it in on your order. So uh, there we go. Three, two, so one. A free bottle when you order some, some wine. Bottle. Exactly. All right. So uh, we're going to go. Fingers crossed this works. Which in which year was Sandman founded? Oh, I think it was well, no one's actually asking 2019. You. Oh, we get in. You've got to press send. We've only got 10 answers. Oh. 1790 is the top answer there. And it was correct. That is. The so, so, well so done, Sophia, Sophia in six, six seconds, seconds, top of the league. <laughs> Everyone ready to go again? Okay. Let's go. <laughs> this is great. I like this. So which of these is not a classic for Ryoka? I'm going to make this big. don't need to see us anymore. Oh, we've got all 12 answers in. What do we got? Oh. oh. What's the right answer? Have I got to go back here to do this? Yeah, I think you might. Hey. Correct. Merlot. Merlot. But who's winning and who's top? The one. Oh, it's a tie it's at the top. <laughs> it's, it's an alphabetical order. Look at that. You ready for the next question? Here we go. Which of these is not a synonym for Tempranillo? You know I love a uh, Tempranillo synonym. <laughs> oh, we've got five answers. We've got nine answers. We've got ten. We've got seconds left. <laughs> oh, 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 that's, oh, that's dividing the crowds. That so, is good. can I say, Tinta de Toro is from Toro. It is. Sensibel. From the south, Uva de Liebre, Eye of the Hair. And Mataro is a synonym for Monastral and Movedra. Movedra. Yeah. So that was the correct answer being the incorrect one. So how long does a Grand Reserver have to spend in barrel when you're in Rioja? Uh, 18, 24, 36 or 60 months? Now, there is it's separate aging between the barrel and the bottle. So this is just talking about the barrel for now. So there we are. Let's find out. Why are we not? Whoa, that? you're booming on. Oh, blimey. So which region was the first to receive its official DO status? Rioja, Reda, Priat, or Carva? Oh, there's confidence on Rioja. Ooh. Is Rioja right? It is Rioja. It's Rioja. Well, question six of seven. What is the relationship between Fidelo and Vadejo? Uh huh. Related grapes like Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris, they are completely different. They're the same. I should have probably given a bit more time for that. There was a lot of reading there. <laughs> oh, the same great spec, differently in each. So I, I like answer four. Answer so four there's a, there, there's something that I thought I knew yeah. until I looked this up today, and turns out they're not related. 
They are not. And here is the last question. Final question. So, what is Alex's mystery gadget used for? Is it, is it even wine related? I'm not sure. <laughs> there should have been an other option. Good question. So. Oh, I do like fix. I do like uh, fixing holes in the chicken coop. That's what yep. I've gone to. We it, thought there could be some uh, trapping of pests. We thought it could be closing a wine bottle. So, it, here, here it is. Okay. <laughs> no one can see it. No. There we go. We'll put it there. There it is. That's him in real life. Here we go. It's the Max Taper. Max Taper. There's a okay. Max Taper. There we are. Right. So let's bring this back in. Because, fingers crossed if I got this right, this should now, so it was for on. tying up vines, and we should, if I've got this very right, be able to see who our winner is. Yes. Dun, dun, dun. The wine giant. The wine giant with six out of seven. Oi, well done. Who is the wine giant? The wine giant needs to uh, yeah, who are announce you? themselves let to us in the known. chat. Let's Let us know. But well done to everybody well done. who played. If you thought that was fun, we can do that again next time. <laughs> I like a bit of a quiz. Quiz is easy when I already know the answers, but there we it's go. It's true. It's true. So um, so let me uh, demonstrate this now. So this is for tying up vines. So what you do is you squeeze it gently down. And when we click this, it grabs the tape. The tape is now in there. This is a biologically... Um, uh, biodegradable tape. Okay, so you have to tie down vine. your vine to the, the thing. Jamie's the vine. I'm the, the the fruiting wire. We go over this, and it Ow! staples it, and we are now stapled to each other, and it holds the the vine to the fruiting wire or whichever wire it is you want to. So there you go. That is what the Max Tapener is So while is he's for. Max Tapening, we're yeah. just going to pop up Wines of the Night Wines so we can have a little little play there and see what you thought. Thank you for sticking with us yeah, with a lack of <laughs> getting in and lack what of uh, camera. camera. But hey, we've got uh, Badger yeah, Cam, yeah, so it's okay. Things, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, no, that's uh, that's good feedback. We we can move that up. We have 15 seconds. We can move it to 20 seconds. We can do whatever Let's we want that, to do with yeah. that. So that's fine. Um, so yeah, uh, but yeah, the wine giant. You need to let us know who you are and where you are, so we can uh, get you uh, get you your Praise. bottle of wine. So we're just going to allow wine of the night because I've I've hidden it so people can't yeah go from there. He says, okay. but you know, any final thoughts? Any final questions as to yeah, what uh, what we've liked, what we've not liked, anything we've missed? Um, I think the, the the only thing that we haven't really talked about is wine aging and alternative packaging. So a very quick alt packaging thing. Alt packaging is great. It glass bottles are amazing. But they're a bit difficult from an environmental perspective. So, what is the best way to buy wine? Well, if you are going to have a picnic, I would suggest going off and buying a can of wine. If you want to have a, a glass of wine in the evening, a can's pretty good too. If you want to have the same wine for a few weeks, go for a bag and box. They are good enough now. The, the the technology has changed. It's much better. So go for those. If you're very thirsty, get a keg. If you want to keep a wine and age it for 12 years, do not buy a bag and box. Do not buy a can. can. Cans, we have found, by actually experimental technique. What's happened to those uh, um, cans of uh, um, wine that we had from the train? They're not great anymore. They're fucked, mate. You're you're alive. Don't oh, be rude. No, I'm fucked. I know. It's it's it's. So, what has happened? It, they they have actually become bizarrely. We're we're in this world where we think that the amount of oxygen that the wine gets 
is related to how fast it goes off. That's not true. It's just not true. It's just, not true. I'm just jumping in. Julia, when were you at the Oxford Wine Festival? You didn't come and see me this year. I did a oh no. Wine, wine, I did a wine and cheese masterclass. It was a lot of fun. But there we go. Yeah. Anyway, back to but, oxygen cans. So, uh, wine needs the right amount of oxygen. It needs some oxygen. The heavier, the more tannic the wine is, the more sort of big colourful, rich wines is, the more oxygen it needs. And therefore, you don't want to put a wine like a Barolo in a can. Mm. You just don't. You want to put a wine like a Pinot Grigio in a can. That's that's perfect. That is absolutely perfect. But it does come down to it. The ageing of a wine, if you want to keep it for a long time, you have to have it in the right package. It's got to be in something like a glass bottle, the corks let in a bit over time. Screw caps are now just as good Absolutely. for aging. And even screw caps can be more consistent yeah. for aging because you can dial it into exactly where it needs to be. Exactly. Cork being a natural product yeah. it still can be. It's a bit up a and touch, down variable kind of thing. There we go. Should we have a little look so at what? Should we have a little look at so wine of the night? Wine of the night. Who's one? Oh, it's gone. I can't see it. <laughs> What's the result? There we are. We said. Oh, it's wine five. Just. Just. With the sherry. Just. With the sherry, like, basically place. the same. Yeah. Holy moly. I, I actually, we'll pop that I up. think my vote's for the sherry. It just kind of shows that, you know, but once again, there's nothing that's left mm. behind. Um, but no, those I'm, are six. What I'm going to pop are... up now, I'm going to come back to us because I can. Why not? But what I'm interested to see is, does anyone change their tune when I pop the prices up? Uh -huh. And there we are. So we've got some value. And I think um, someone mentioned, you know, they pick their favourite wine. It is the most expensive. And yes, the Grand Reserva is the most expensive. A, what, are you but, saying a 22-year-old wine is more expensive than one from last year? No, surely no, not. Absolutely. So there's the prices. If you love them, pop in, buy them, have fun with it. But 30 quid's not But bad. 30 quid for, you know. A twenty-year-old wine. I think if you if you were buying a Bordeaux that was thirty years old, if you were buying a Burgundy that was thirty years old, if you were buying a Cali Cab that was thirty years old. So, what's going on with us? What's going on with us? So next month, I'm giving this guy a break. He's taking a break. He's out of here. I'm going. Month. So I have. We're doing wines of Germany and wine law, and our good friend who, if you've known us for a while, Lee Isaacs, is coming on to co-host with me. Um, I'm going to be talking great. a little bit about my my trip to Germany, and we're going to attempt to make German wine law fun <laughs> and interesting. Um, or at least understandable. Exactly. So, so we've got that going on, which is really exciting. We are doing the first uh, tasting in our winemaker series. We're doing um, the wines of Louis and Martina, Massive Sonoma oh my God, and so Napa cool. Valley uh, tasting yeah. in conjunction. Yeah. Also, hopefully you've seen an email or you've seen the uh, little flyer in your thing. We did a thing. We've, yes, we've made an advent calendar. So obviously that's a, our rendering that's because we're a, waiting for the bits yeah. to arrive with us. But we are doing our varietal advent calendar. 24 wines in 24 days. Different 24 grapes. grapes. Yep. So not only fun, little sip of wine. So it's, yeah. it's the pouches. So it's 100 mil every day and 24 wines, 24 grapes. So not only fun educational so you should probably buy one for yourself buy one for a gift and uh keep you can everybody reserve happy. them for just 10 pounds why did you pick these ones because a i thought they were cool b they've got a story c hopefully people will drink a i'm going back to a and b again yeah. people will drink stuff that they love but also find something new to yeah. have a taste of so and oh. if you go hey i love that they're all going to be in stock so you could buy a case in time for your christmas dinner and if there's something that's not your favorite you get guess what I've learned this. And to let you know, there's a mm. lot of new wines. It's not just, hey, here's a repeat of everything we've done in the last year. There's wines that haven't been on the show. There's a couple of cool things because I just get obsessed with wines and I have to do it. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of new wines that nobody's had before. So lots of good fun stuff. Thank you, Jonah. Congratulations on our Decanter Award. Um, it's it, there with you. It's here. It's here. That's right. There, yeah. there we are. Happy days. So, so we we were awarded by Decanter Magazine um, as the runner-up in the best online wine tasting competition. Yeah, 
So I hope everyone's had a wonderful night. Yep. It's been a pleasure. Lots of fun. I think lots of cool wines. Once again, yes. Mighty Giants, send us an email because we need to know that you exist so we can get you that bottle of wine over. If you love the wines, buy them. The 2001, when it's gone, it's gone. I think I've got yeah, the last few less. bits and pieces. So if you like that, buy it now. Um, but otherwise, we will see you next month. We will. Tell a friend, bring a we thing. Will. Well, well, he will. You'll see me next month. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I'll sort the calendars out. Cool. Okay. Anyway, have a Take great care. night. Absolute pleasure. Good night, guys. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.